Bradley is a former professional heavyweight boxer with ultra right wing views. A patriot of his country, he makes ends meet by working as an auto mechanic. One day, he brings a broken down car of a new client to work, but at the entrance, he is met by his boss, who asks Bradley to follow him to the office. Bradley does not intend to do that while realizing that the thing is about him being fired, so he tells the boss to spit it out as is. Come in my office. You can tell it out here. I don't work in an office. I don't need to squeeze into one to hear some bad news. It's a tough time for businesses right I'm not now. not really interested in the economy. Am I getting laid off? I'm sorry. Upon hearing this, Bradley takes his belongings from the locker room and drives home in a depressed state. At home, he sees his wife outside, sitting in the car, and having a very emotional dialogue with someone on the phone. Already suspecting something wrong, Bradley heads over to her. The woman is shaken, as she did not expect to see him so early. He notices the hickey on her neck and, barely containing his anger, snatches her purse in order to check her phone. A terrified Lauren, that's the wife's name by the way, admits that she's having an affair on the side. I've been seeing somebody. Bradley forces her into the house and takes out his anger on the wife's car, literally tearing it apart with his bare hands. Legit auto mechanic for f**k's sake. Upon entering the house, they start a frank and pretty tense dialogue, during which we find out two curious things. Firstly, the couple had a miscarriage a few years ago, which knocked them both, and they began to close in their feelings, less and less communicating with each other. On top of that, they both had severe drinking problems. Lauren admits that she was sure Bradley was cheating on her because he wasn't at home in the evenings. However, he claims that he is faithful to her and confesses in finding a part-time job that he kept in secret from her. They regret what they have done, and Bradley suggests they start from anew and try to have a baby again. Lauren does not understand how they are going to live. She is barely working, and Bradley was fired in the first place. I only get called in the substitute once or twice a week. You just lost your job. The man says he will call his old buddy Gil. These words make Lauren weep. She does not want her husband working as a drug dealer, but Bradley assures her that it is a temporary measure and he'll just be a delivery guy. Give me some time before you get close. A year and a half later, Bradley delivers goods to some drug den-like projects. The man has already acquired impressive connections due to his integrity and professional approach. Hey, Johnny Rebel. Howdy. You can give me a sample this time. Talk to your boss. Oh, let me earn it direct. I promise I can put a great big smile on each of those nuts. No, oh, thanks. I don't want anyone to see their braces. After receiving the money, he gets into a brand new Ferrari and drives to the hideout. Having parked in the middle of some wasteland, he removes the license plates from the car and covers it with camouflage netting. Afterwards, Bradley informs his boss that the deal went successfully. There are two more Ferraris parked outside Bradley's house, and the house itself now looks more like a luxury mansion, which means things are looking up for the man. He walks into the kitchen and sees Lauren cooking. Bradley grumps at her for wielding a knife. I don't want you handling a knife right now. Please, put that down. But the woman replies with a smirk that it already feels like hyper-parenting rather than just caring for his wife. He lifts the wife up in his arms and carries her into the bedroom. But a phone call interrupts them. Bradley's boss, Gil, is urgently asking him to come. When they meet on the spot, Gil says that he's waiting for a Mexican from the cartel, who will become their new supplier. Literally, just a minute later, the cartel member walks into the room, accompanied by two thugs. This is Bradley. It's my top runner. His name is Eleazar, and he introduces his goons, Roman and Pedro. He adds that they will accompany Bradley during the delivery. Surely Bradley is not too fond of such a company, and he declares that he will not take Roman with him. I'm not doing a pickup with him. And for what reason? He looks like he's using. Roman's been clean for two years. I test my employees. Gil tries to persuade Bradley because only such a firm and principled runner can deal with such thugs. He needs this supplier, and he says that Bradley himself has had drinking problems. The bottle ain't the same thing as junk. Yeah, don't kid yourself with that bullshit. You look at my brother and your old man. Having motivated Bradley with three months off after the birth of his baby, the friends agree to the deal. Bradley says he will be in charge of the team and asks Elizar to order his bulls to obey Bradley unquestioningly from now on. Roman, look at me. If I say dump the package, what do you do? 
Yeah. The bosses seal the deal with a handshake, and Bradley goes on a mission that night with his ballast. He notices Roman's gun and tells him to put his hands behind his back. The big guy kindly refuses him. Man, f you. I don't Go against me and you two can swim out on your own and do the pickup. Pedro reminds Roman of their arrangement. In the end, the bald man searches the Mexican and throws his weapon into the water so that he doesn't hurt anyone accidentally. They jump on Gil's boat and go to the agreed place. Near the buoys, Pedro dives down and retrieves the cargo from the bottom. When Bradley comes back, he senses something wrong, so he dumps the bag in the water and tells them to do the same. Dump, we'll pick him up later. Go. However, they can't stand him ordering and just throw a couple of punches at Bradley and go to their car, where they are surrounded by the police. A shootout ensues. Bradley wants to get away, but his patriotic and principled disposition prevents him from doing so. He helps the cops by shooting Pedro. Roman fires a burst of bullets at Bradley, but he manages to escape into the water. Meanwhile, Pedro is shot in the head by a cop. Good night. Bradley sneaks up on Roman from the other side, wounds him in the shoulder and knocks him out with a couple of punches. After the showdown, he surrenders to the police. During the interrogation, the detective says he is amazed at Bradley's courage. He has seen the footage from the police body cameras. Thanks to his actions, not a single police officer has been killed. Although, even that will not help Bradley get away with it. However, helping the investigation process may make it easier for Bradley. The detective tries to push on Bradley's patriotism and the imminent birth of his daughter, but the man refuses to name his boss. He also says that he will get four or five years tops for his courier work, and he is ready to be held accountable. Who supplies your crystal? Some guy. Some guy got a name? I forgot. Would you remember if I showed you a list of names? I don't like to read. I won't even see a movie if it's got subtitles. Lauren visits Bradley, and the man asks her not to come to the court hearing so as not to disturb her unnecessarily because it will not do her any good. He also forbids her to visit him in prison and bring his daughter there. He doesn't want his first meeting with daughter to happen in prison. When he gets out, he will explain everything to her himself. I'll wait for you, no matter how long it is. Never, never make that mistake. Yeah, I promise you. I know. The judge sentences Bradley to seven years in prison. Bradley is clearly shocked by such a blatant injustice. So much for helping the cops. Depressed, he goes to his new home, Franklin James Prison, locally known as The Fridge. After waiting in a long and tedious line at registration, he turns in his belongings. The guard demands that Bradley remove his ring. The man reluctantly obeys and accidentally shuts the window a little louder than he should. The pampered guard flinches and, like a typical nerd who's gotten a little power, tells the man to go to the back of the line and go through the procedure all over again. Sorry, I didn't mean Reclaim to. Reclaim your possessions and take your place at the end of the line. After the search, he was given a robe and sent to his cell block. There, Bradley is met by the prisoner responsible for his adaptation. He tells him the basic rules. While he is escorting him to his cell, one guard offers to join his boxing club, but Bradley refuses. There's a boxing program here. A good one. I'm one of the coaches. Not interested. During the conversation, the guard learns that Bradley used to box. The old man takes Bradley to his cell and tells him what time dinner is. Bradley is in no mood and says he will skip it. The man gives him a bar and says, Lots of guys skip dinner when they first get here. Two or three in the morning, you'll want it. Left alone in his cell, Bradley lets out his anger in his usual way. During the night roll call, the guard harasses Bradley again for being late and reminds him about boxing. Like the bell at the beginning of a boxing match. Ding, ding. Bradley is super calm and does not take him seriously. That same night, some people break into Bradley's house. After waking up, Lauren vomits at the door of the bedroom and grabs a gun. However, the thugs manage to knock her out with tranquilizers. The next morning, the supervisor calls Bradley. She informs him that his wife's obstetrician has contacted her, saying she has some health complications and he needs to talk to the man. Dr. Pellman's your wife's obstetrician? He said there were some complications in the pregnancy and wanted to discuss the matter with you in person. Bradley gets all nervous while waiting to see the doctor. The guard escorting the man to the visit room once again urges Bradley to join the boxing club. Upon entering the cell, Bradley sees a stranger. Who are you? Where's Dr. Pellman? Sit down. He tells Bradley that his betrayal has cost Eleazar three million dollars and they want him to repay the debt. He shows Bradley a photo of Lauren being tied up. 
The stranger says that they have brought in a doctor from Korea who can do terrible things if it is necessary. There is an abortionist from Korea. He works for my employer. He claims that he can clip the limbs of a fetus, yet leave the child in such a condition that it will live to be born. He tells Bradley to kill Christopher Bridge, an inmate of Redleaf Maximum Security Prison, who is held in cell block 99. Bradley replies that he can't get into Maximum Security Prison on a charge of delivering illegal drugs. However, the gray-haired man suggests Bradley to get creative. Otherwise, the limbs of his child will be sent to him. On the way to his cell, the man realizes that he must act immediately. He attacks the guard, the one who was suggesting Bradley to box. Look, I'm sorry for busting you earlier. I was just hoping to get you in the prison boxing. Quite an impressive boxing fight ensues. But strangely enough, the guard is not too happy about it. Bradley is more experienced and easily defeats the boxing coach and finally breaks his arm. The backup arrives and Bradley gladly surrenders. Overhearing their dialogue, he learns that for this fight, he will only be transferred to a lower level. So he carries on aggravating his situation by picking a fight with the convoy. During the fight, one guard knocks out his colleague with a blow to the back of the head for some reason. After a stun gun discharge, Bradley is finally transported to Redleaf Maximum Security Prison. Upon arrival, he is met by armed guards, led by the warden. He explains to Bradley all the strict rules of the prison and orders Bradley's belongings to be thrown on the ground along with his wedding ring. He brags that his men are much tougher than the wimps in the fridge. The men here aren't like those f***ers over there at the fridge. And offers Bradley to put them to the test. Prisoners are expensive and we're only too happy to help the state balance its budget by deploying some cheap land. He is given a deep search right outside. Then the guard tells to put him in the most squalid cell. In his cell, Bradley almost throws up because of the clogged toilet smell. <laughs> The wardens tell him that if he behaves well, he will be transferred in two weeks. Covering his face with a t-shirt, Bradley goes to sleep, but after a few minutes, he is awakened for a walk. In the yard, he meets another inmate, who tells him that Block 99 is a place isolated from the rest of the prison with the most outrageous scumbags and psychopaths. Bradley decides to act immediately. Brad, Brad what's wrong with you? It's Bradley. I'm psychotic. He approaches the Mexicans and provokes them into a fight. And we'll use that one. We're using it now, gringo. Don't call me a foreigner. Last time I checked, the colors of the flag weren't red, white, and burrito. Wanna start some stuff? The big guy easily thrashes the Mexicans. Even their sticks turn out to be of no use to them. And look, just another NPC knocks out his friend with a blow to the back of the head. The fight is interrupted by a rifle burst from the watchtower. The guards enter the prison yard and Bradley beats them fiercely, breaking the arm of one of them. Only the cold steel of the revolver cools his temper. Finally, Bradley is taken to cell block 99 with a bag over his head. He is gently guided down the stairs and he finds himself in a dark basement. A power lifter's belt with an attached stun gun is put on Bradley. The warden demonstrates how it works and Bradley falls to his knees. He says that points are awarded for each offense. For the recent fighting, he was given 25 points. Each point equals one electric shock. They will be tasing him anytime they want. When you are eating, when you are sleeping, when you are pissing, and when you are shitting. Bradley is brought to a new cell littered with broken glass, on which he immediately falls from another electric shock. He calls out for Christopher Bridge through the small window in the door. Christopher Bridge? <clears throat> Christopher Bridge! But the neighbor replies that there is no such person here at all. The conversation is interrupted by another electric shock. The guards take him out into the corridor and begin to abuse him with that very stun gun. Do not blink until I give you permission to blink. They say that his friends want to see him and then lead him to the end of the corridor where he is met by Elazar and his entourage in a spacious and cozy cell. It turns out that the feds found him and put him behind bars. He blames Bradley for all his troubles, the loss of his money and the death of his sister's husband, Pedro. My sister is now a widow. The guards give Eleazar the remote for the taser and ask him not to kill Bradley today. The thugs harass Bradley by beating and tasering him. Eleazar shows a picture of Lauren and says if he lays a finger on any of them, the surgeon will do his dirty work. Afterwards, they knock Bradley out. It's a long, slow payback, Blanco. In an unconscious state, they drag him to the cell. 
Upon regaining consciousness, he tears the sole off his shoe and puts it between the taser and his body. As they say, a car mechanic has to know his way around electricity. The guards once again take him out into the corridor where Bradley starts faking pain from the taser. When they let their guard down, Bradley attacks, disarming them. Then he slowly begins beating them, demanding the keys to the shackles. In the process, he accidentally kills one of them. You stupid, stupid asshole. You killed. I know what I did and locks the other in a cell. Meanwhile, in Eleazar's cell, one of the fighters is literally dancing around a makeshift punching bag. Bradley enters, and the cocky fighter goes out with the heavyweight for a one-on-one -on -one fight. Surely, Bradley knocks him out without too much trouble. He then literally erases his face against the floor like tires against the asphalt. Legit auto mechanic, for f**k's sake. Oh, f Two other henchmen try to stop him, and while Bradley is dealing with them, Elazar calls his assistant and tells him to start the surgery if he doesn't call back in 10 minutes. Having knocked out his opponents, Bradley proceeds to stomp on their heads the way we used to stomp on beer cans in the backyard as kids. Eleazar unsuccessfully tries to blackmail Bradley. Call him off. But he doesn't respond and breaks his legs, forcing him to command the surgeon to stand down. Eleazar doesn't give in. Then the man drags him to the pervert cell. Right now I'm dragging him to a bunch of guys who will f*** him bloody. Eventually the Mexican can't stand it and asks the assistant to let the woman go and take her to Gil. Bradley drags Eleazar into the cell where the guard is locked up. Stay put. And at that moment, the warden and his men come running to the cell block. Bradley says he'll finish off the two hostages if they try to break in. He adds that all he needs is just to receive one call and then he will surrender straight away. One minute after I'm off, I will turn myself over to you. And I swear that to Jesus Christ. Eleazar's assistant and the surgeon bring Lauren to Gil's house. Don't approach the vehicle. While they are reversing, Gil pulls out a hidden rifle and kills the assistant. Lauren snatches the weapon from him and kills the surgeon as he tries to escape. Oh, he said Bradley picked the winner. Gil calls Bradley and tells him it's over. His family is safe. He puts Lauren on the phone and she suggests he say a few words to their daughter. The man wishes her to grow up smart and healthy. Lauren says she moved as in response to his words. Bradley can't hold back his tears. We want to come see you. When can we come see you? I don't know when you'll be able to come visit here, but uh, I'll try to figure that stuff out. He says goodbye to his wife and breaks the phone. Then he reminds the warden of the spare minute promised to him. You ready, Mr. Thomas? I still got that one minute I told you about. In that time, he walks into the cell, shoves Eleazar's head into the toilet, and kicks it like a guillotine. A minute later, the guards burst into the cell. Marlboro Man commands him to turn around with his hands behind his head, after which he shoots Bradley. Hey guys, wait a second please, I have something important to tell you. You can watch an extended recap of this movie without censorship on my telegram. The link in the description and in the comments. And now let's count how many people in the comments were triggered by me calling all cars a Ferrari. Well guys, this was my recap of the movie Brawl in Cell Block 99. Thank you for watching. See you soon.